This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. gentlemen this is cosmographia the randall carlson podcast and we have reassembled the entire crew as usual we are joined by bradley how's it going brad quite excellent did you just get back from another road trip i'm apparently a road tripping fool and loving it yes i just yes. got back and uh two weeks till we head back out to the scablands for the next group of tours so absolutely yep. yeah i i envy your road trip style Nomad Brad. Yeah, Nomad Brad. Continues on. Mike, how are you doing, sir? All right, guys. Nothing going on here. Just life rolling along. Life rolling along in normal town. As, That's right. as normal. <laughs> and, of course, the man of the hour, Randall. Sir, how are you yes, doing? Yes, Russ. I'm doing well, Russ. Uh, yeah, just all kinds of things. You know, we're working on the uh, putting together the preliminary pieces to launch a some courses this fall sacred geometry uh courses so we're kind of outlining the game plan for that we've got a little bit of funds to work with and after the successful nashville uh event uh week and a half ago uh we were really excited about doing it, it had a good reception and it seems like you know since i used to do regularly regular seminars workshops classes and things on the subject I kind of put it on the shelf for about a decade and revisiting now. And there's some new interesting connections that have come out in the last few years. So I figured, and a lot of renewed interest and new interest in the subject uh, and a lot of woo out there. And I thought time to dispel some of that woo and show that it's really on a, a good uh, factual and logical and historical basis. So uh, we, what we did was we had a Friday night lecture and then we did a Saturday and a half a Sunday, uh, workshop that was all hands-on. It was all basically teaching people how to draw geometric forms in the classical method using straight edge and compass. And of course we provided our custom made cherry wood compasses with brass fittings to everybody. So uh, we had 60, we had 60 seats for the in-house. We met in a beautiful Masonic lodge in Nashville, um, and we utilized their lodge room. They had set up, it was 60 seats. It was all sold out. So we had a full crowd. It was the, the it was actually the largest sacred geometry drawing class I've done. So I couldn't have done it That's except awesome. for I had help from Brad, uh, Pat Dahmer, um, the boys who organized it, Warren Story and, and Ryan Turbeville, they were great helping. So we all did coaching. Oh, and Stephen Tuggle. Stephen too, yep. Yeah, so we had five guys trained uh, to at least to some level because um, we did a series of coaching exercises before because, uh, you know, when you're doing that and you're going through the steps, there's always people who miss, miss something and they're raising their hands. And, you know, if you've got a dozen or 20, it's... 20 is a lot for just one for, for myself to handle, you know, because there might be three or four people's hands going up. How, I, how do you do that step again? Where do you put the compass? That kind of thing. So I go over there and I'm helping them and there's three other people waiting and then things get bogged down. But so we had what five, five guys there were assisting, yeah. move, moving around the, the, the room there, helping people that were stuck and I couldn't have done it without those guys helping. So that was, um, but it was sure a lot of fun. I had a, fun a good event. time. Doing Absolutely. It. it was, it was a fun event as usual, really good people there. Then, uh, after our, um, we did a half a day Sunday in house, you know, doing exercises. We got, we, of course we never get to cover as much as I wanted to cover, but we did get up as far as uh, introducing people to the, the golden section also, you know, the divine proportion, we went through the Fibonacci sequence and things like that. Um, we did cover quite a bit, but you know, again, I, you know, we could easily do a week long and I'm thinking that's at some point we need to do that. 
find a really cool place to hang out with with all of the supporting systems there and uh kind of make a week of it and and but also include some field trips and outings like on this one we concluded with a field trip so i don't you guys know this right that nashville has a full scale accurate replica of the parthenon yes yeah. i've seen it yeah yeah it's uh pretty interesting and, and really impressive. yes very impressive. So we went there Saturday night to see it at night. And then the next morning or the next afternoon, we were there. Um, and Saturday night, we didn't get to go inside. It has, what, a 42-foot tall, tall statue of Athena that was yeah. recently commissioned. The story on it's pretty interesting. It goes back to the 1896 Centennial Fair that they had in Nashville. And they created a whole village of structures out of, I don't know what the other structures were, but they were out of basically plaster and lath. And so they weren't designed to, to, you know, endure more than the time of the Centennial Fair, which lasted six months. So um, at the end of the six months, they started tearing it down, but people, people had become so attached to the Parthenon that um, uh, they created a petition or something to leave it, to not tear it down. So they didn't tear it down, but being plaster and lath, not designed to to last, it did manage to last for 20 years. And so by the end of the 20 years, it had gotten so deteriorated that they were going to have to tear it down. And uh, some philanthropists came forward, some, uh, you know, leading citizens, they raised the money and spent the next, what it was, 10, 12 years building this thing. And it is beautiful. And like Warren, you know, one of the, the organizers of the of the weekend, he basically said how you get this sense of almost uh, harmony. Um, he says he almost goes into a meditative state when he goes there and he's in the vicinity and he sees this structure. And he, what he did not know, and I, I demonstrated this in the class, is that the facade is a perfect, is framed by a perfect golden rectangle. And, and when you divide the rectangle up by its harmonic components, you find that the primary structural elements of the Parthenon are positioned according to those harmonic subdivisions. And so it's not like just some random thing. It's, it's part of the design. And then, of course, the antasis, which to me is really fascinating, which is that the, um, they actually change uh, diameter, the columns, as they go up, so that the perspective is that when you're from the ground looking at it, they look like a, a you know, a parallel yeah, size. Straight, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was really, really was interesting. So the, the Athena statue. Uh, he, sorry, Randall, I missed that there. I, I probably told the people the wrong thing then. I was thinking it was a, a route three across the front. You're saying it's, it was a golden rectangle? Golden rectangle. Oh, man. Okay. Bradley. Oh, my Unbelievable. God. Unbelievable. Quick. All right. Stop the recording. We got to get lost quickly. Lost we have to correct this. boys there, Brad. <laughs> 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 ongoing kyle's leaving he can't take it can't even. <laughs> right kyle just yeah he's bailing it's too <laughs> i'm done with this podcast false leaving. information <laughs> don't trust yeah. brad well i can i i can relate to the uh meditative state i haven't been to the parthenon or to the one in nashville but we went to some temples in egypt that do the same yeah. thing They're, do the same thing yeah so and of course i haven't had the opportunity to to see if they had included, you know, sacred geometry, but I'm sure that many of them did. And there were some of them were like in the temple of Seti the first, uh, -huh. uh at yeah. Karnak, um, it, oh, Karnak Luxor, is... Luxor. I mean, it's just, it, it's so beautiful and so immense, but at the same yeah. time, like open and airy and just, I don't know. There's something had, about it. Yeah. One of the things I showed was what I did show the temple of, at Karnak there. And, we worked through uh, my goal, and we just bare, made the goal, which was that I wanted to ch teach people about what I call the master diagram, which is all the root ratios from from one up to we. I take it up to root six, and the properties of those root ratios, like root two, root three, root four, root five, root six. You know that if you have a square, any square and you take its diagonal, you've got the root two ratio, right? Because the diagonal is the root two times the length of the side of the square. 
And so you can, by, by creating a square with that diagonal, you can then use that diagonal to lay out a rectangle whose length to the width is the square root of two to, to one. Assuming you establish the side of your square is, is just one unit, then the diagonal becomes the square root two of those units. So if it's one foot on a side, it's square root of two times a foot, one foot. Um, so anyways, then interestingly, if you have that rectangle, you start with a square and you have its diagonal and its diagonal gives you the root two. You then use that through a simple geometric operation to create a root two rectangle. And when you take its diagonal, it gives you the square root of three. Now, right. both the root two and the root three are irrational, uh, non-repeating, non-terminating numbers like pi or or phi, the golden ratio, is, is non-repeating, non-terminating. Those numbers have special properties. And so you, we explore those properties. And they're incommensurable in the in the in the linear uh relationship, but then they're totally commensurable with whole number relationships as soon as you go from two dimensions up to three dimensions and include area. So they have this really interesting property. I then showed how back in um, ancient Egypt, the two prominent units of measurement that were being used um, in temple building were the Riemann and the Royal Cubit. And the Riemann, in terms of our modern day American foot of 12 inches, or uh, uh, in terms of feet, was 1.2165 feet, right? So if you draw a square Riemann and then you draw the... Um, you draw its diagonal, you get 1.72 feet, and 1.72 feet is the royal cubit. So right there, you know, I mean, it's clearly an intentional. They use that. So their, their fundamental unit, you would lay out a square, which is a Riemann on the side, 1.2165 feet, and then, which is 14.58 inches, I believe, and then the diagonal becomes uh, 1.72 or 20.6265 inches, they relate to each other as the square root of two to one and exactly the same as the royal cubit to the Riemann. And then it goes from there. So we went through that sequence and I showed how that geometry ended up yielding a, a whole set of historical measurements used throughout the centuries uh, in various cultures, in various times, yet we're all linked by this common geometry. Like I said, if you have a, if you then create a root two rectangle, and you, you grow it, you generate it right out of the square, and you take its diagonal, that's the square root of three. And then you can use that diagonal to generate another root rectangle, which is whose long side is the square root of three, whose short side is one. That square root of three to one, um, if you take the, the, the Riemann times the square root of three, you then end up with the, uh, sometimes it's called the Palestinian cubit. It was also the cubit referenced in, uh, Ezekiel's prophecies, and, and this is assumed by some scholars to be the, the cubit that was used to build King Solomon's temple. And so now you've got the Riemann, the royal cubit, and the Palestinian cubit all connected by this geometry. And it doesn't stop there. It includes megalithic geometries, Assyrian, Sumerian, ends up actually the root two, the root six times the original Egyptian Riemann, almost within just the tiniest fraction of an inch, gives you our modern yard. So that was where we, where I wanted to take it was this master diagram that served as a template, and that template can be found in use all over the ancient world, all the way from you know Greece and Egypt, um, in Vedic uh, cultures. In we find it in it's in South America. It was we, we find it at the basis of monumental earthwork architecture in the eastern woodlands and Mississippi Valley of of America. And, and basically, what I'm saying is a template. It's as, as if that template, almost if they, you laid this template out on the ground, and then you developed your, your, your dimensions and ratios of your structure from that template. And this is a remarkable thing when you show the number of ancient structures that were held in high esteem, sacred structures, whatever you want to consider them, that conform to this particular template, which to me is a very interesting thing when I correlate that with Dave Matheson's work of showing how the same astronomical template, mythic template, links all of the, the, st uh, the star lore and traditions about the constellations from all over the world, from all of these different cultures who had, had the, same, um, the same conceptual framework for 
the, the, the night sky and the, the symbolical stories that were juxtaposed on those star groups of the night sky. I mean, you guys know Dave Matheson's work, right? You've been there. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? And he, he, st he says that he, he expresses it by saying that these ancient cultures were all working from the same template. And, and, and I've said exactly the same thing in terms of the geometry that was being used for these ancient structures. So now you think that, okay, these ancient cultures all over the world were working from the same template of geometry and the same template of astro mythology. Now that is a really interesting correlation there that you can't just dismiss. It, it's too much to say, oh, this is all coincidental. And to people who are this, I call them, and I think this is a new term we'll put out there, pseudo skeptics. They always like to say, oh, those pseudo scientists and pseudo this and that. Well, they're the pseudo skeptics, okay? So the pseudo skeptics like to uh, basically dismiss things, ignore things, you know, they think it's going to go away by a wave of the hand and a, you know, a sneer on their, uh, in their voice or uh, a snort of derision, a snort of derision. That's all. <laughs> and that's all it's going to take, but they don't actually sit down and look at it. Well, explain this. Don't ignore it. Explain it and try to, and, and, and let's consider the possibility that maybe there's more than just coincidence going on here. If they even go so far as to admit that there is a connection or a correlation, it's then usually dismissed as coincidence. Or you're seeing patterns, you're projecting patterns where there aren't any. That's often said. I remember Michael Shermer made kind of explained a lot of the, the conspiracy type things away with that. And 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 I agreed with him halfway, but only halfway. You know, yeah, I, a lot of that woo stuff that's out there, yeah, half of it is BS, but that's only the other half is is authentic. So you, I, I don't want to get too far away from them. I know we got to get back into the climate change stuff, oh, yeah. but but I did want to ask now that you've gone through some of that and what you taught over the weekend. Like you said, you were also dispelling some of the woo. So can you give us like a small example of what you were talking, what you mean by woo with sacred geometry? Oh, I'd have to probably, I mean, it's, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the stuff that, um, you know, well, you really, you want me to? Okay. No, so, you know, that's okay. Don't have okay, to answer so, the question. Okay. So, okay. Let me, I, 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 I <laughs> like, I really, what it was more based in reality than geometry though. So right. I, it's, it's yes. I they mean, call I it could, woo -woo? yeah, I could show examples. Like I, the first thing that comes to my mind is some of the stuff spun, spun around the flower of life. Okay. Um, and when you start linking geometry with channeled stuff, which I've seen some of, you know, that was kind of yeah. one of the things that, you know, going back when I was regularly teaching courses in the nineties and early two thousands, uh, that was the thing that I noticed that when I started that the, the woo factor didn't seem to be really noticeably present too much, but by the end of say 15 year run, it was like, you know, all of this stuff. Well, but, so and so, you know, the, the what do they call them? The uh, you know, the 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 ascended masters said this and that about, you know, yeah. and they start using the term sacred geometry and you know, they couldn't they couldn't provide a proof of the forty seventh proposition of Euclid if their life depended on it. <laughs> but there is a weird connection with uh, you know, magic folklore type of stuff with geometry, right? Like the 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 person practicing the magic will go and draw some crazy oh, yeah. like, sacred geometry symbol on the ground and then put candles in it and do whatever. So it does seem yeah. like it has and, been and, and let me, yeah, utilized. And, and, and I can say this from my own experience. I think it works. I mean, it worked, to, you know, my experimentation seemed to work to the point where I discontinued experimenting. Wait, summoning demons and stuff? <laughs> Not summoning demons, but <laughs> we'll... Save that discussion for another dime. All right. So it scared right, you now enough you have to you my interest. Keeps my interest. What's going <laughs> Look, on? We mean <laughs> See, all, all this time, I've, you I've heard you go on about, about, about sacred geometry before. And Randall and, I had this, Randall and I have had this discussion that I'm a bit of a skeptic about, about sacred geometry. Yeah, it's interesting. You, but to <laughs> me, all the stuff about sacred geometry is like people who play with calculators and you punch in numbers and all these numbers, and suddenly you come up with boobs, you know? 
It, to me, it's, just, it's the equivalent. I don't understand. <laughs> What's the big deal about sacred geometry? Okay, well, it's. <laughs> I've seen Randall do the boobs trick many times on the calculator. So, <laughs> Mike's just not a numbers guy. A, it's, the boobs. It's, there's an aversion to numbers, and a lot of people have that. It's, it's true. I, I am an I'm aversion to numbers. Well, let's see. Yeah, and 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 I, I'm fine with that, Mike. I'm totally fine with that. I mean, you know, I mean, I actually no, kind you of just have look at me like a mental cripple. That's all. Well, yes, but I mean, <laughs> no, actually, Mike. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I have, I have. Well, let me put this way: I feel compassion for you, Mike, because <laughs> you uh, the normalcy. Uh, yeah, I mean, my God, to be stuck in that. Never mind. I. It just I, seems I to me if your pity. I'll take your pity. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. No, at some point, I listen. I I'd be happy to show you some things that I think you would go. Okay, there is a rational side to this. You know, when you start looking at, for example, the 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 um, the the ubiquitous appearance of the golden ratio in processes of growth and form. Yeah. When you see the repeated see, and it's not woo. This was known that ancient builders, architects, did use geometry. That's one of the whole key insights that we get from Freemasonry. I mean, the whole the whole edifice of Freemasonry is based around the ancient use of geometry. And, you know, when you cite example after example after example that where, you know, from talking about a root two rectangle, you know, where some large structure within a matter of a few inches, really, uh, artists, yeah, are known, absolutely known. There are scholarly works done on um, the, the templates that artists use to set up their canvases. And it's based upon the same ideas. The say the, they use the, the golden section, they use the root two, they use the root three, they use several other methods, but this is, this is well established historically. So, you know, right, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's the connection, ahead, it's the connection to the, the, the fundamental aspects of the universe itself, right? Like the, 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 when you look at the, say crystalline solids of all the elements they have a very specific geometry that also follows all these rules oh yeah molecular the geometry of very Scale much so variance. very much so right but, so, see, but, but I, I understand I'm, though but what does it mean i mean what you know what can you infer from that i you know i i just you know I see, I see the petals, you know, I, I, in a sunflower. I see, I see the, 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 the repeating patterns in flowers, repeating patterns in, in, in geometry. And you know, I understand the value of geometry in the mathematics, but, but. Damn, nature, what a mushroom trip would do. Yeah, for I was Mike. just about to say, somebody, <laughs> somebody, get the mushrooms for Mike. We got to get him out. There's just a barrier, and that opens that barrier, and you see through it, and then there's that connection, and you're just missing it. But there's, it's, it's there, man. Well, no, I think, I think Mike too that the, that it's, I can't say personally like how do I know what it means? I have no idea what it means, but it is fascinating when you start really looking into the to geometry like in physics and all this kind of stuff the way it seems to repeat itself over and over again and it's just fascinating to me i didn't think that these magical rituals that utilized you know drawing sacred geometry on the floor i i thought that was like a misuse or a misinterpretation of something that we forgot in the past like oh there's this stuff that's fundamental to the universe and if you use it you could build and create and and then people mistook that for some kind of magic. That's what I thought. But then Randall just says that it actually works. So, <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's what I was trying to get back to. Tell us more, Randall. Come Tell on. Tell us more. Give us a hint. <laughs> uh, that's a story or several stories, actually, for another day. Okay. Does this have to do Weather with how you help Robert find his keys? Um, oh, shit. Right. I mean,. It Is does. There an, sort of an extension yeah, of there's that. a there's that's a kind of connection. Too. It's a couple of okay. steps removed, but that's that's good. I'll, okay. I'll, I can, I've seen I can it in sit action. with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was semi magical. All right. So. So we were talking uh, superstorms, climate change. Yeah. Now let's see. What's the that? day today? It's uh, 24th 20, of August. 24th. Yep. Uh, where are the hurricanes this year? Building up to the peak on like September 10th coming up. Okay. Is that Not what's much happening this There's year? There's a couple of the little things out there. 
There's a few swirlies. Yeah, there's Poof. always a few swirlies. We could change the definition of hurricanes, and there'd be a couple out oh, there. Oh, well, you know, that's what they did. They, they, uh, yeah, with the tornadoes, you were showing us that they started measuring the really small ones, right? Yeah, the F0 and F1s. Yeah. They're able to define the difference between a 73 not, yeah. mile an hour storm and a 74 mile an hour storm yeah, that all of a sudden sorry, make, made it an F0. Yeah. yeah. Well, we went through how it is that, you know, when the, when the, uh, records started being kept, um, you know, in the Midwest and say going back to the mid 20th century and earlier, you know, the, there's a whole lot more people living in those regions now in Tornado Alley, um, a whole lot more um, people witnessing tornadoes and reporting them. There's the Doppler, the introduction of Doppler uh, radar, which is now detecting cyclonic storms that would have been completely overlooked. Early and, 90s. Um, yeah, in the early, right, in the early 90s. Um, also, the fact that they can go in, which they didn't do before, but the assessment of the damage will tell them, you know, the, 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 the scale of the tornado. And what we saw was that, yeah, it, the graphs that were produced made it look as if the, the absolute number of tornadoes was on the, a steady increase. Yet what was on the steady increase was the increase in reportage and not the actual number of tornadoes. And then when we looked at the graphs for the actual number of tornadoes, we there was two things. I showed two graphs. One graph was all, all tornadoes, and then uh, the most destructive tornadoes, F3 and above, or was it F4 and F5, right? What we saw with all tornadoes was that there was no trend in what it was 70 years or something. There was no trend that could be detected. For the top two tiers of destructive tornadoes, the trend was actually very obviously down. And this is, this is data directly from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This isn't, you know, some, some, uh, you know, whatever right wing site or whatever. Um, the other thing is that, uh, we saw that there was no trend with, uh, tornado cyclonic storms, which the, 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 the accumulated cyclonic energy covers, uh, cyclonic storms in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, you know, the Pacific equivalent of hurricanes are typhoons, but in either case, they're cyclonic storms. And I did pull up a graph. Might be interesting to pull it up again, uh, which basically shows, uh, the accumulated cyclonic energy. Let's see, I should have it right here. We go. Um, All right, there it is. So you've got uh, all hurricanes is the upper graph, meaning equal to or greater than 64 knots, and major hurricanes greater than or equal to 96 knots is the lower one. And so, you know, you look at each, each, both of these two graphs and show me, is there a trend there? Is there a trend of obviously increasing hurricane intensity or frequency? Doesn't look like it. And this is the most rigorous statistical database of cyclonic storms in both the Atlantic and the Pacific right here. Is there a trend? Well, there was a big, here was a big spike following in the wake of ENSO that might have had something to do with that, with the, the huge release of heat from the Pacific Ocean. This spike here coincides with this spike here, which was all hurricanes. But if you're looking at this, you know, you're going to assume from this that, yeah, there's a catastrophic increase in the, in the intensity or frequency of hurricanes. I don't see it. I don't think you can draw much of a trend line here. No, it looks just like it kind of is going up and down. Up and down, up and yeah. down, the way it has been doing for millennia. Right. You know, this does not tell a story of, oh, my God, we're in the middle of a climate crisis that's being that's being proven by hurricane activity anyway. No and, hockey stick. Yeah, no hockey stick here. And, and likewise with, with tornadoes. Um, in fact, let's see. Does this look like it? That's it. There you go. All right. We, 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 we got the, the um, presentation. Well, yeah, so here's your graph of, of tornadoes going back to 1950. So we're, you know, 71 years, 72 years later. And clearly you look at this, this graph and you're going to go, oh, look at there. 
you know, tornado frequency is obviously increasing dramatically. Uh, and, there, you know, it's got to be proof of global warming, right? Well, then we went through, we dissected the whole thing, and we showed how basically this is a graph that's not showing actual numbers of tornadoes. It's a graph indicative of the reporting of tornadoes. And then we went through point by point how it is that over the decades, the number of uh, rep um, reported tornadoes has gone up immensely um, for those multiple reasons that we just discussed a few minutes ago, from the number of ob observers to the assessment, the able to include, see, they used to not, for example, and if nobody witnessed the tornado, they didn't really have a system in place for assessing the, the intensity of the tornado based upon the, the damage that it caused. But now they, they do. They, they've got a very scientific way worked out by looking at largest, uh, you know, objects that were moved and the swath of destruction, how wide, how all of that stuff, they can assess the intensity and the scale of the tornadoes. So that's been added into the database. Then, of course, the Doppler radar, as Brad said, you know, coming into the early 90s, you can actually see um, 1991. So this is, you know, at the, very close to the introduction of Doppler radar, radar. So and then they got more systematic ways for people to report. Um, rather than just sort of a, a scattered and sporadic methodology, they've got a whole system now in place where people can report. And so all of these factors together have considerably increased the number of reportings of tornadoes. But when you go to the graphs that show just the numbers in absolute terms of the tornadoes, here's your, um, here's your annual count of EF1 plus tornadoes, 1954 through 2014. Compare that with the previous one, which clearly gives the impression of a major upward trend. But we've just gone through, it is not a major upward trend showing a trend in actual numbers of tornadoes. It's showing the trend in the reportage of tornadoes. And when you look at the actual numbers of tornadoes, where's the trend? And then this is F1 plus, right? EF1. Now look when you go to the extreme tornadoes, which is strong, F3 plus, it's actually a downward trend. And again, this is right from, from data source, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Here's the thing, though. When you go to the website, either of uh, NOAA or I think also the EPA, they're showing, they're showing this graph here. That's what you see. How many people see that graph and then actually dive into the specifics? What, 1%? So you have to dig. Used to be. Once upon a time, probably not too long ago, you saw these two graphs. They've been buried. They're there. They're buried. And most people are not going to see them. But what you see when you go to the website, right on the landing page is that first graph. So it's misleading. And I think that it was uh, intended to be, you know, it's deliberate. Um, so, yeah, then the other thing uh, we need to talk about, too, is, you know, this, this one degree of warming that basically, you know, supposed to be evidence that we're having impending catastrophe. One degree of warming, basically since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right? One degree of warming, which is attributed to the increase in carbon dioxide from 280 parts per million up to 400 plus parts per million, right? One degree of warming. So, but remember this, this is the important point to keep in mind is that the the beginning of the industrial revolution coincides within decades a few years of the termination of the little ice age which was the coldest half millennium in the entire holocene so you know you get without knowing that you have no perspective for talking about or can even thinking about this one degree uh warmth that has occurred because when you go back to the medieval warm period you know, what do you see there? Well, you see that actually it was warmer than now. And this is something they've tried to bury too. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to show, I'm going to show you. Uh, so wait, the, just, just to reiterate, the little ice age was colder than any other period in the 10,000 or 12,000 years of the Holocene. You got that right. That's and right. Is there, are there any, what are the ideas on what caused that cold period? 
combination, uh, and I think the most likely is they've argued back and forth. I think it's both solar and volcanic. Okay. That's, yeah, there may have been other factors. So it was but, kind of an anomaly. Uh, yes, it was an anomaly within the within the Holocene, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah also uh, changes in the ocean circulation and variations in Earth's orbit. Yes, well, yes. And axial tilt. And axial tilt, yes. All of that changes okay, in Earth's so orbit would a include. Confluence of well, these are the cycles. these are the ideas that are thought to have okay. contributed. We're going to look at quickly two graphs so I can show you, um, and I'm not going to get into the the specifics of how this uh, statistical manipulation occurred. Um, this in this episode, but we should dive into it uh, at some point because this is this is this is important. Okay, so. This is the so-called hockey stick. As it says, the top graph, um, well, let's see, there's two graphs here, but I've got the same caption. But we'll look. The top graph charts the temperature variations in Europe during the last millennium, as shown in more recent IPC graphs. That's this one. The original graph, as published by the IPCC in the early 90s, it was actually 1992 in their uh, first report that came out, which is shown below clearly depicts the Little Ice Age in the medieval warm period and shows that it was actually warmer than the present. Through statistical manipulation, and the, the earlier graph was flattened out, eliminating the Little Ice Age in the medieval warm period, and a hockey stick was substituted in its place. So here's the original graph produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1992, in their 1992 report, and then four years later, when the next report came out, it had been replaced, right? So here's the original graph down below. And so this is, this is a major fraud right here. But, you know, it's, it's a bit complicated. It's tricky. They did a whole dance. Um, and, and it's the way they assessed, they used a limited database, basically, to get temperature trends throughout uh, the last millennium is basically what they did. And we can go into that. I, I do want to go into it. I want to go into a full deconstruction of how they went from this graph, the, the lower one, which is an accurate depiction of the last thousand years. And there is the, there's the medieval warm period right there. Look at that. Medieval warm period. And here's the present warming right here. So this graph definitely was not see and, and i think what it is is the naivety of some of the scientists that were working on this believed that they were supposed to actually present the real science and the real science supports the lower of the two graphs it does not support the upper graph but then politics intervened and four years later that the lower graph got replaced by the upper graph notice the 20th century average right there 20th century average, yes, we're higher than the 20th century, 20th century average. And you can see the blue here, this represents the, the variable Little Ice Age. And you can see here this period of the coldest part of the Little Ice Age. And then finally, uh, you know, between in the late 1800s, it came, we came up into what would be considered the modern warmth. It, di it dipped right here again. This is interesting. This is a, a mid 20th century dip that I'll show you in another graph. Um, that actually occurred, you know, the, the, the early 20th century had a, was amazingly warm. That's this right here. So if you look at this orange right here, that's the 1930s, centered around the 1930s in the time of the Dust Bowl. And one of the most extreme droughts in America since, Amer since the founding of America. And then in the 1940s to 19, late 1970s, the climate actually cooled. And then it began warming again as we get into the 90s and the 2000s. Because we were blowing up nuclear weapons. You think that, that was it? Yeah. Little nuclear winters. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, they were putting a, that, that must have blasted a bunch of material into the air. I'm sure it didn't compare it to volcanoes and stuff, but well, that let was me, the first thing I thought of. Let's see There's if I can. Lots of nuclear testing going on during that period. But is wouldn't it, a nuclear, this ending, like, wouldn't sorry, a nuclear winter indicate cooling? Not yeah, I'm yeah, talking about the what... cooling that happens after oh, that initial. 50. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's. I mean, that, it's okay. just, this has got to be. I mean, it's infuriating to see that politics 
is influencing scientific data to come up with a certain outcome. As much as you know, I mean, it's, it's irritating as hell to me to see it from my perspective, but to know what you know, Randall, and to see how this is just fraudulent has got to be so, I mean, it's just a, man, it's a ruse. It's crazy that this can be pulled off. And Randall, people believe I, it, and all these people that are environmentalists that think that they're supporting the planet and they're, you know, believing that these da this data is accurate, it's 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 a lie, and they just don't know. Man, well, uh, my my question, Randall, is: Can you go back to the previous graph that, that compared the two? Yeah, I did say I didn't want to dive into it too much on this well, just, podcast. Just one question. Sure. That one, yeah. That one. So what do they, the, the, the text says that they came up with the hockey stick by, by taking out the uh, Little Ice Age, the medieval warm period. What justification did they use for that? Well, is, see, is going beyond the extremes? No, that's exactly what I was referring to. I didn't really want, it, it, it gets, it's pretty involved, um, what, how they did it. And it's all statistics, and it's by limiting the use of your proxies, basically, is what it boils down to. You ignore you know, some proxies that support uh, a warm period, warmer period during the Middle Ages, and you look at others that support no warming period. It, 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 a lot of it is based on tree ring data, where the, the bristle cone pines that they use were known not to respond to uh, warming in the same way, um, because they're adapted to a cold climate, they did not respond, it, it, but it was a very limited data set. And, and this is what I said, I didn't really want to get into that here, but we will, we can spend an hour dissecting well, let's, let's, and let's deconstructing. Stop, but, but just a short answer is then the, they, they played with the statistics. They played you, with the statistics. That's okay. exactly the, that's the short they answer. They basically threw out what they considered the extremes to try and find a median. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, all right, but they did it arbitrarily. They didn't say, okay, let's ignore, they just said, let's ignore the reality and find what we think is the reality. Well, like I said, they used a very limited data set, and the data set that they used were from northern high-latitude trees okay. that were known not to respond to the type of warming that a lot of other vegetation would have responded to. So, in other words, um, yeah, that's that's in a nutshell what it was. But, okay. But yeah, it, it's worth diving into. But um, maybe like a later show. But this yeah, is yeah, we, this is just should. a fascinating comparison. I, I had not seen this before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I yeah. So it's uh, and people need to see it. They do. So let me go to this. Let's see. Go to this graph. Let me see if I'm going to have to stop share here. Come on here. Okay. Let's do this. I'm probably going to have to stop share and reshare. Okay. All right. Let's take a break. Then. All right. That's great. All right. We'll take a break and be right back. All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Cosmography, of course, and we are about to go off some more, as Randall just said before we started the show again. Yeah, well, Randall <laughs> said go off some more just That's before right. we started going off some more. That's right. So where are we going off? <laughs> there is a well, launch point. There's lots of tangents we could go on, but, uh, you know, I'm just going to pick out some examples. You know, we'll go through some of this over the next couple of podcasts to try to set all of this on a solid footing so that people can really get a handle and get their heads wrapped around what's true and authentic and what's propaganda. So we're going to go to a, another graph right here. We'll start by looking. And, at and if you want to prep people that are ready to dive into it, there is an uh, extended article that you wrote, what, eight, 10 years ago, the redemption yeah. of the beast needs updating, uh, but yeah. And, and that's, that's, uh, if it's not already on the RandallCarlson.com website, it will be soon. It is on the GeocosmicRex.com site. Um, but yeah, if you're really passionate about this topic, Randall digs deep and explains it thoroughly, and uh, you will have a new perspective when you come out on the other side of reading that. 
Yeah, it's kind of specifically addressing the question of, of carbon dioxide and its role in nature. Right. All right, so see if this works. Are we looking at temperature anomaly graphs? We are. We are. All right. All right. All right, let's break it down a bit. This is from, uh, you know, the climate NASA, climate.nasa.gov. So that should be a red flag right there, .gov. Um, and this is uh, referring to the scientific dash consensus. And uh, as you can see here, we go over, started 1880, we're ending almost, this was a few years ago that it came out, but the, the general idea is pretty much the same. Temperature data from four international science institutions all show rapid warming in the past few decades, and that the last decade has been the warmest on record. Uh, and you've got data sources, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, you've got the Met Office Hadley Center Climatic Research Unit, and the Japanese Meteorological Agency. Now, just, just as quick as a side, the Met Office Hadley Center Climatic Research Unit was the uh, is the primary source for most of the data. And NOAA and NASA both do rely on the data that comes through the climate research unit in uh, climatic research unit in, in the UK. Uh, just to remind people, this was the, uh, the research organization that got caught with its pants down when, uh, when the, some of the chief scientists working on it were conspiring to cover up uh, certain data regarding the climate. It was, uh, East Anglia University, right? Uh, well, it was sure. part, I think, yeah, maybe, I don't remember the exact role of, they, there were several institutions that were, you know, the lead scientists were communicating with each other. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's something we really should, should dive into as well, is look into the whole climate gate thing. Again, you know, it's one of those things that I followed it pretty close, you know, back 10, 12, 12 years ago. I, I don't want to try to speak too authoritatively on it right now um, without pulling up and having the data right in front of me or at least reviewing and refreshing the data of who said what. I think, you know, Phil Jones, he was the head at there of, um, I think he was with Climate Research Unit. So, yeah, it was that uh, it was that a bunch of emails were hacked from their, the East Anglia University uh, database or something. And so, well, and yeah, and that's what they say hacked, but I think it's far more likely that they were leaked. Yeah. Rather than hacked. You say hacked, then it's some, you know, unscrupulous character outside breaking in and stealing something. But if it's a leak, then that's different. Then that's somebody going, perhaps, well, I need to release this to the public because this is deceptive. It's not right. So I'm going to leak this. So it's yep. a lot of it's in the in the word you use. Is it hacked or leaked? If it's leaked, of course, then it's coming from inside. If it's hacked, it's coming from outside, and it well, could be more, somebody more like with, a whistleblower. Like a leak to leak would mean a whistleblower. That's right. Yeah. But what one of the things interesting, like if you go back to 1880, well, there we are. We're at the end of the Little Ice Age, and notice the notice the temperature anomaly. The, the gray line to zero would be the average, I'm guessing the average of the 20th century. Um, it doesn't say, but that's the most likely interpretation of it. You'll notice that right at the very beginning of the graph, it's right at minus uh, 0 0.2. And then you go over to the right, I'll use my cursor. And well, right in here before that last spike right there, um, it's up at about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So this is degrees centigrade. So let's let's consider we'll go 0 0.8 all the way up there. So from minus 0 0.2 up to 0 0.8, that's that's your one degree right there. So nobody's really arguing that the that the climate um, warmed by more than a degree since the end of the Little Ice Age. Um, and of course, when you look at this graph, though, it can be misleading just because of the temperature range. Now let's think about this. This graph has a temperature range of minus 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8. Well, that's 1.4 degrees, right? Yet we know 
that the temperature naturally has changed between 10 and 20 degrees centigrade. So the y-axis here is just a little slice of, of the, the, the known documented temperature changes in the history of this planet, and not even the remote history, the recent history, you know, coming out of the, the ice ages and so forth. Well, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at what I call um, creative graphsmanship, okay? When you start playing with the range of your data and your scaling factors, you can make graphs give all kinds of different impressions. So we'll go to the next graph, and basically it's the same graph we just looked at, uh, it's a couple of it's a few years earlier, but it tells the same story. Like notice here, this increase right here, uh, and it's not showing. Okay, first first thing that's wrong with this graph is again, where is the the the, uh, the 1930s warm period? You don't see it at all in here, do you? But you get to this one here, right? Early 40s comes up to point two, and then. If you follow the trend for the next uh, almost 40 years, it's actually cooling. That's what I'm – so interestingly, with this graph, if you think about it, okay, 1940, 1945 is when our fossil fuel – during World War II is when our fossil fuel consumption really exponentially took off. Yep. And then it's increased throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s up to now, right? But what you see here, if you think that fossil fuel – uh, usage puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Yet what we see here is there's actually at the point where carbon dioxide starts becoming a, uh, a significant comp, uh, element of the atmosphere when it goes from roughly 300 parts per million up to like 350 parts per million, the climate, instead of smoothly following it, which there's no reason to assume necessarily that there should be a long lag, right? It's just like, if you're if you're cold and you put a blanket over you, the retention of heat is instantaneous, right? And the Earth is a body that's emitting radiation, and if you increase the opacity, the thermal opacity of the atmosphere by introducing more carbon or more water vapor, as the case may be, there's no reason to assume that the reflective effect of that carbon layer is not going to be immediately detectable. In other words, you put the carbon up there, and as soon as the carbon's up there, every it, it's immediately started reflecting neutrons, right or photons, rather, right back towards the Earth. So that effect should be immediate. There shouldn't be a 40-year delay, but there's a 40-year delay, and it's right here from 1940 to 1980. And then it started climbing again. And so where it's at right now is it's about 1, 1 1.2 degrees warmer than it was at the end of the Little Ice Age. If the previous graph that I showed you was accurate, it actually showed a medieval warm period that was several degrees warmer than now, right? Than now, right? That, and then you saw in that graph how it dipped down, and we had the Little Ice Age where it was 1 to 2 degrees colder than now. So if your baseline, and this is accurate, what I'm saying, the Little Ice Age was like the coldest half millennium of the entire Holocene. We can dive into that. We can you know, devote some time to looking at the evidence for that. So think about this. Our baseline for determining that we are now in unprecedented warmth was unprecedented cold, at least in terms of the last 10,000 years. So that's important. Where's your baseline? What are you using as your base to compare? Well, so let's let's go to the next version of this graph, and we've added some more information to this. Um, so here you have, let's see, over here on the left, you have the variance from the 1961 through 1990 mean. Okay, so here's your temperature numbers over here. And notice it's the same numbers you've got here, minus 0 0.6 plus 0 0.8. So that's what you've got over here on the left. You got your years down here. So you've got, it goes back to 1856. I think the previous one only went back to 1880. This goes back to 1856. So it even goes back farther into the Little Ice Age, right? 
Okay, so here's Little Ice Age. Look at this. Little Ice Age, and now coming out of the Little Ice Age, World War II, fossil fuel burning increases exponentially, and we have a 40-year cooling trend. And then it starts upward again. Over here on the right-hand right hand y-axis, you've got this line right here. And what that represents is based on the um, Mauna Loa mean carbon dioxide. You know, this is the the monitoring station in Mauna Loa that's uh, taking samples of the air and and then determining through a whole complicated process of how that sample that they've grabbed there represents the average concentration of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere, okay? So that's what this graph over here represents. And you'll notice here this, this from zero up here to 550 parts per million. So here's the graph. It goes back to, oh, just about... 1957 or so, it was probably the International Geophysical Year when they established that, that carbon dioxide monitoring station at Mauna Loa. So then you see that it's trending upwards. Here it's uh, 350, 60, 70. Yeah, it's about three, 370 parts per million when this was done. Um, I'm guessing this is, this is a pretty old graph. I mean, I, I grabbed this thing years ago when I was you know really immersed into trying to understand these pre processes. But the, the, the general idea we're going to extract from this is still absolutely as valid as, the, as it was when this graph was produced. And because the difference now is that this graph has continued up and is now just beyond 400 parts per million. So there's your 400 parts per million right there. There's your 550. So the, so the, 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 the range of carbon dioxide goes from zero to 550 parts per million. Okay, let's go to the next graph. So here, you'll see what has happened when we change the uh, data range on these on the y-axis, right? Over here, we're going down to minus one, and here we're going to plus one. So we've changed the variance axis a little bit, and it says, says here, setting a narrow y-scale range allows more detail, but everyone must beware. The plot is stretched. Over here to the right, look at the range now of carbon dioxide from 280 pre-industrial concentrations to basically now 400 parts per million, right? Look at this, the steepness of this graph and how it corresponds to this uptick here that we've got, you know, since, since the, the 1980s, right? So... Here's the range of carbon dioxide concentrations. All right, during the Ice Age, it went down as low as 180 parts per million. And we know that throughout the history of the planet, it has gone up to as much as seven and 8,000 parts per million. Okay, it, so, so what is normal for the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere just depends on what time frame we're looking at. But notice other, here, whoops. So when the other thing to notice before I go to the next slide is that here you've correlated 280 parts per million to 380 parts per million on the same Y scale as minus one to one. Okay. So now you've got this correlation so that when you juxtapose the two graphs, this blue line is your carbon dioxide. This up and down green line is your temperature. Your x-axis is your time series, your time, your, you know, from your time axis, okay? So now let's go to the next one. Okay, so now here, we're going to a more realistic temperature range for the Earth from minus 10 to plus 10, right? So this is now variance from the 1991. And we know that's, that's based on the long-term view of the Earth. We know that it has been up to 10 degrees warmer than now and up to 10 degrees colder than now on average. So let's take those known um, limits that we've got and use that to scale the Y axis, okay? So that's what's happened over here on the left. Over here on the right, again, I said that we've had, it's been documented that six, seven, maybe even 8,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide has been that high, right? as low as 180 parts per million, and I should mention it at 150 parts per million, plants, 
photosynthesis stops at 150 parts per million. That would mean essentially that during the ice age, the lowest point of carbon dioxide concentrations was only 32, 30, 30 parts per million above the, the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide that would result in the death of the biosphere. Now that's something you need to put in mind. Now, most of Earth history, carbon dioxide has been much higher than now. So what we have in here now is zero to 10,000 parts per million. We could scale a hundred, on this, on this uh, range of data and this scaling factor over here on the right, we could consider, we could start with zero because that's, you know, you, you typically don't start your graph, you know, at, at the limits of your data points. You extend it so that you can encompass Otherwise, for example, you would completely miss outliers if there were, and occasionally those outliers are significant. That's what's known as the lurking variable, right? You've got some outlier that you would normally dismiss. Oh, that's outside of our range. It's some abnormality. We don't need to think about it. But every once in a while, that abnormality completely changes the whole interpretation of everything, right? So over on the right, we have zero to 10,000, right? Which is closer to the long-term variability of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then looking only back to 1800, 1880, or 1900, or 1956, 1957, when the, when the monitoring station at Mauna Loa was put in. So now when you adjust the variables of your graph, look what happens here now. Let's go back one. Look at what happens to this green line when you actually go from not just the, the, the temperature variability of the last 120 years, but the temperature variability of, say, the last 100,000 years, look what happens to the green line. There it is. And then when you disconnect the carbon dioxide graph from the... Um, from the, the variability, the temperature variability to graph, look what happens. Look right down here. There's, there's the catastrophic increase in carbon dioxide right down there. Now, if this was the graph that was being promulgated throughout the media and by environmentalists and all of this, you think this graph here is gonna, is gonna have the same dramatic impact? It's, it's the graph that they're using now, which is which is this one. And then, God. then the variation of this one to this, where they've made it look like this rise in carbon dioxide directly corresponds to this rise in temperature. But here you see, when you use more realistic, longer-term data points, this is what happens. See, how many people really look at the statistical basis of all these claims that are being made? And this is what I'm trying to show here is that, you know, as it says here, why don't our graphs so look it, like the IPCCs or the ACIAs? Yeah. The answer is scale. If we scale temperature to suit alleged 10 degree centigrade warming potential, then the last 150 years has been a very gentle rise. Right. It shows a rise. Yeah, it just it doesn't look catastrophic. That's what you're no. sort of trying to point out. But this this even this graph, which has a much better y axis, uh, still starts at the end of the last of the you know the little ice age. So it's yeah, it's probably still deceiving in terms of long term. Well, actual. in terms of long term, yeah, yes, but but the I, I, yeah, I but see the what thing you're is saying, this yeah, this yeah. is the same graph using the same time series. Sure, right. Yeah. And it says if we scale 1% of the atmosphere, that's what this is over here, 10,000 to one, uh, over 1 million parts, uh, then our carbon dioxide is obviously a mere trace gas at approximately 375 parts per million by volume. And that's it right here. Wow. My PPM meter must be not calibrated properly. <laughs> well, it brings up to me, you know, again, and you know, maybe I can't verbalize this right, but it just the the way that you get the funds to produce a certain outcome, right? So these these 
people, these scientists are getting uh, the, the data to match what somebody else tells them that may be funding their projects. Yeah. And that's just disgusting that that's, it's, it's not strictly the numbers. It's the numbers according to what the people that are paying for the research uh, want. Right. So, yeah, uh, uh, that's awful. And now having gone through and looked at that, here is, you know, um, so, you know, the, 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 the skeptics of this, the people that are the, the scientists that are saying, no, it's not settled. They're, they're, they're trying to explain and get people to understand what I, I just showed you. Right. So let me try to get this. It's here. like, it's, it's kind of like if you were, you know, if you're trying to show profits in stock prices and you've zoomed your up and down part of your graph all the way into fractions one tenth of a, of a, of a cent. Yes. And you yeah. see this yeah. huge yeah. spike and it actually has gone yeah. up like less than a penny. <laughs> and you're like, yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you got it. Right. You got it. <laughs> gone up 0.8 cents. <laughs> the other thing right, though so is, is that when you, what's not clear to me is that when you heat, like if, if we, if the whole planet warmed up, then the ocean would outgas a ton of CO2. So you would have, an increase in CO2. And then if you cool, like you were saying during the ice age, if you cool everything down, it, there's the a ocean sequestration of CO2 from, you know, it's, it, it soaks it up. Yeah. So how do you know that one is causing the other? Cause I mean, I can tell you right now in the winery, if I, I've got still wine in there, that's done. If I warm it up, it outgasses a bunch of CO2. Yeah. Yep. So I yeah. can, Say for that's, sure that that's a cause of the increase in CO two, not the other way around. Well, to really to 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 really get, you know, really a, I think a solid handle of understanding about all of this, we we actually do need to look at the sun, and the yeah. evidence that's, for the most part, being ignored by the IPCC, uh, that has come to light. You know, the IPCC was established right around the time we were really deploying solar observing satellites. So there's really no data for those guys in the early 90s to incorporate into their computer models. But we now have, you know, three decades plus of data from solar observations. Right. And that material is not being utilized or not even being incorporated into the models, except in a very limited fashion. And, and some interesting studies have come out in the last year or two documenting the deficiency and what happens when you begin to include some uh, some of the aspects of, of solar variability into the climate models. And we'll get into that. But again, I, I don't want to get into everything tonight. Otherwise, I'd rather devote a little bit of time to a more in-depth explanation, just like yeah. we went through now. Well, I'm, go ahead, Kyle. No, so there, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Everybody go ahead. <laughs> All I see what you're to... doing. You're you're showing us graphs and manipulation of statistics and what, you know, the, the it makes perfect sense. It's not about what's really going on. It's just look at the data and look at how it can be shown in different ways. So Yeah. And I'm going to so show it, you it may be unclear that humans are not as as powerful as the sun. Mhm. Mm hmm. Okay, so let's do this share because here is this very same graph we just deconstructed. And here's your NASA Climate 365. Okay, look, so with here, some scientists can't agree on Earth's temperature changes, right? So, the, like, in other words, they're paraphrasing the, 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 the uh, opinions of the skeptics or the, those who are questioning the climate change narrative, the climate crisis narrative. In other words, some scientists, and of course, they don't name any of the scientists, because if they did, they'd be some of the most prominent science scientists in the field of climate studies and climate research. So the way they do this, and they use this for propaganda, some scientists say, some say scientists can't agree on Earth's temperature changes. Well, here's what disagreement looks like. And then they have the NASA Goddard, it's exactly the same graph we just looked at. And I pointed out how basically you've got two sources of data here, which also, you know, um, so, you know, you look at NASA, they're, what they're doing is they're correlating their data. 
and making sure that their data allies, that it lines up. Um, but so again, it's it, there it is. I mean, it's, it's that graph being used for um, propaganda purposes. We just saw how if you change the assumptions of the graph, the whole impression completely changes. Now, do you think that if they used instead the, the last uh, uh, incarnation of that graph that I showed, that somebody would look at it and go, oh, God, we're, we're doomed. We're in the middle of an unprecedented climate crisis. No, they wouldn't. So what they've done is they've artificially stretched that y-axis here to give this effect. They've chosen the, the, the range of data and the scaling factors to give this impression. Once they've done that, they're now putting, you know, this, well, some say that scientists can't agree on Earth's temperature changes. Because the fact is, is that scientists do have disagreement. And I just cited solar physicists are one. And we can get into that and should get into that. The other factor is, is something that I think we should get into a little bit here while we have some time left. Yeah, and I think they're also trying to imply that the only disagreement that you can see in that graph is the little places where the four different sources have slightly different temperature measures. Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, all four graphs are basically saying the same thing. Right. With some variability. Right. I mean, That's it would, the it, disagreement is those little variabilities. That's what they're trying to say. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're yeah, they're being dismissive. Like, right. oh, they're being sarcastic, really. This is yeah. sarcasm. Yeah. You know, yeah, some, oh, some people... You know, some idiots are saying that scientists disagree. Well, you know, all these, all scientists are in agreement that, you know, uh, that's what they're talking about, the uh, the consensus. The debate is over. The science is settled. Everybody agrees. And that's what they're saying here. This, this graph pisses me off. This Good. What they've done with this right here, you can go on to the NASA Climate 365 website. There it is right down here. Look. There We're it is. It. We're not seeing it anymore. Oh. Oh. I'd, I'd like to read a definition of propaganda, too, just to sure. get into that. I think that, that'd be great. Got a second. Go for it, Because, yeah, that, that, the words, you know, tossed around pretty regularly these days, and I don't think people really get it. So, yeah. Well, you're pulling that back up? Yeah. Yeah. Propaganda is communication that is primarily used to influence or persuade an audience to further an agenda which may not be objective and may be selectively presenting facts to encourage a particular synthesis or perception or using loaded language to produce an emotional rather than a rational response to the information that is being presented. Mm -hmm. Well, that pretty much defines it right there, doesn't it? It sure does. Yeah. It sure does. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, are we seeing the generalized global carbon cycle? Got it. Got it. Okay, <laughs> I like it. All right, well, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. There's a couple of things I wanted to point out. This shows this the cycling of carbon dioxide through the atmosphere, through the oceans, through the groundwater, through the soil, through the the, the canopy of vegetation, and so on. This is a bit dated, um, you know, the, the, the amount of the gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide injected into the atmosphere as a result of fossil fuel burning has increased since this was published in 2003. But what I want to look at here is you can figure this has gone up. It's, it's higher than 5.5 gigatons per year, gigaton being a billion tons. Typically, on an average year, and of course, this is over a short term, and it's uh, actually, this is a number that would be adjusted upwards, 0 0.1 gigatons per year. Um, land use changes, 1.6 billion tons, gigatons per year. Land photosynthesis and respiration, 120 uh, gigatons per year. Uh, oceanic photosynthesis, 107 gigatons. And I'm going to go to the next one. This shows another variation of the same thing. Animal and plant respiration is putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Soil microorganism respiration, 
putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which the atmospheric reservoir, about 750 gigatons, or, you know, roughly, you know, 10 times the, the amount of carbon dioxide that's assumed to be the result of fossil fuel consumption. Um, photosynthesis of land plants uh, consumes about 560 gigatons per year, right? Because it's getting taken up. Now that will have increased as well because of the fact that there is so much more biomass on the planet now than, than there was um, a few decades ago. All right, and that's something else, that's something else we're gonna talk about. Uh, dissolved carbon dioxide in ocean water, 38,000 gigatons. So when you think about the respiration of the ocean and the volume of carbon dioxide that's in the ocean, it's enormous compared to um, the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, which is enormous compared to the amount of carbon dioxide introduced into the atmosphere each year through fossil fuel consumption. But the thing is, you have to keep in mind that plants are consuming huge, huge volumes of that carbon dioxide, wherever it's sourced. And, and, and Kyle, you mentioned earlier the idea of oceanic outgassing. And certainly that is something worth looking at because typically we mentioned solar variability. If the sun causes the planet and hence presumably the oceans to heat up, they're going to outgas carbon dioxide. And of course, see, here's the danger where there could be this negative feedback loop is that as the, the climate cools during an ice age, then the oceans cool as well. So then the oceans start sucking out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that's why it got down to 180 parts per million. And that's damn close to being globally catastrophic for the biosphere. Like I said, 150 parts per million, plants die. Photosynthesis stops, the biosphere dies. And then we're in a pickle, right? And so, you can imagine it's not, it's probably not just a, a, a cutoff line. Like as it, as it goes down, it can only support so much plant life. So, right, they're competing for that, for that trace gas. Well, here's the thing. Here, here's the thing to keep in mind, we'll, 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 and, and you'll see how significant this is in a minute, is that you have all of the plant life in the ocean and the oceanic life also consuming carbon dioxide. You have algae and, and forams and, and, and small single cell creatures and small multi cell creatures, oceanic benthic forams. You have, um, um, you have a whole variety of, of living things in the ocean, plant life that is consuming carbon dioxide. They're making shells out of that carbon dioxide. Those plants, those creatures that are consuming carbon dioxide, they die. Their remains stiff to the bottom of the ocean. And if we look here, and then what happens to those remains? They become lithified into what? The uh, ocean sediment. Yeah, limestone. 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 Yeah. Exactly, limestone. Um, so if we look here, you see the storage in shallow ocean waters, 39,000 gigatons. But now look at the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the sedimentary rocks, meaning primarily limestone, but some dolomite, which, which all cycle through. Remember, all of this had to cycle through the atmosphere, then get taken in by the ocean, and then get taken in by, by marine uh, life. And then that marine life passed away, settled at the bottom of the ocean. Their remains became lithified into limestone. And that limestone is now locking that carbon dioxide up for millions of years, right? Now look at the amount, 100 million gigatons of carbon dioxide locked up in the limestone. So that's telling us right there that 100 million billion tons of carbon dioxide has been cycled through the atmosphere, taken up by the ocean, and then taken up by marine life, which then died and became limestone rock. Burn limestone. <laughs> <laughs> those guys back. in texas are surrounded by limestone and i remember driving through some of those canyons with them uh this spring and it's like man it is unbelievable this is a whole lot of forams mm -hmm. you know that what whatever was in the ocean and sank to create that there was just it's, it's just unimaginable 
It is. How many of those those creatures there must have been to sink to the bottom to leave all that? And and it's not just Texas. You know, we're going right. through them in in uh, Kentucky and Ohio and Tennessee and yeah, I mean, it's, it's there had to be thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> square inch. <laughs> yeah, it's not square nanometer. <laughs> um. But see, here's the thing. This is showing you how unbelievably effective the carbon dioxide pump is, sucking this stuff down and sequestering yeah. it. Yeah. And in fact, if if you could stop replenishing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it wouldn't take but a few decades for the atmosphere to be utterly depleted. Yeah. That would be an extinction-level event. Yeah. That would be an extinction-level event. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, that's why I called that article, which is almost 90 pages, looking at the role of carbon dioxide in nature, is why I called it the redemption of the beast. Why did I call it the beast? 666. 666. Six, six. What is 666 six, six, what, Kyle? Six. Oh. Carbon. Oh. Six uh. electrons, six neutrons, okay. six and protons. six protons. Yeah. It's biblical. Genius. Genius. It's biblical, yeah. The number of a man. I'm not claiming that's anything more than a coincidence. <laughs> sure. Just like sacred geometry. I will. <laughs> that's more than a coincidence. There more is some interesting geometry to the carbon. It it um, does make interesting geometric patterns. Oh yeah. Yeah. It does. And oxygen. Right? Eight eight eight. If you want to go that way, Jesus. No, we don't want to go that Life, way, bro. No, we don't okay. want to go in that direction. It's a whole, di- it's a whole different show. Okay. There will be that. Yeah, that's old. <laughs> That's a whole different show, Brad, <laughs> yep. when, when we're ready to go in that direction. But, you know, there are some pathways you just don't want to embark upon until you, you're well prepared because there are many dangers and pitfalls along the path. By the way, the factories in that... snare you. have the, to be more of an adept. The factories in that picture are doomed. And they're also producing <laughs> something akin to yuds. <laughs> yeah. Yuds. Yuds. Yeah, there are produce, yuds coming out of those factories. That's right. <laughs> Oops, it's not a yud. Ooh, there are yuds coming out. Hmm, I, I, you know what? I never noticed the yuds coming out of those smokestacks <laughs> before. Uh, so, yeah, that's I, just a little perspective when you think about it. Yeah, that's That's a cool. whole lot of carbon dioxide that has cycled through this planet's atmosphere. So what I just want to ask. Maybe if we've talked about this before. What are the what is the question mark of the arrows going back and forth between the ocean and the sediment? Is it just questioning how much the ocean pulls yeah, CO two out yeah. of the rock? Is that what it's yeah? Okay. Well, sedi- yeah. Uh, what, what in the last in the uh, in this one? Let's see in this one here. You mean yeah? When we were just looking at, there's arrows going up and down at the bottom of the ocean, like in and out of the sediment there. With question oh yeah, mark. because they don't really know okay. how, the, the magnitude of that exchange. Okay, yeah, uh, but I can tell you. Anymore. So, for example, if you have a, a quake, so th- it was exactly that that led me to do this research right here. Um, Fourier hmm. transform infrared microanalysis of pseudo tacolites, which are friction induced melts produced by seismic slip from the Nojima Fault in Japan, reveals that earthquakes almost instantaneously expel. 99% weight of the wall rock in CO2 content. Ah, uh, okay. Carbon oh. is exhaled because it is supersaturated in the friction melts by extrapolation to a crustal scale fault rupture. Large events such as the M7.2 Kobe earthquake in 1995 may yield a total production of 1.8 to 3.4 times 10 to the third, which is 1,000 tons CO2 within a few seconds. Right, wow. so the slippage of the of the two rock walls along each other creates yes. so much friction and heating that it releases the trapped CO2 in the, you got it. Wow. You got it. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. And, and, and see, that's not really fully understood. Sure. Yeah. Thank, thank God for Randall Carlson who can read and <laughs> interpret all this stuff for us. That is just awesome. Oh, well, shucks. <laughs> so, okay. Damn. Uh, so yeah, this is yeah. So here you have the the Matsushiro earthquake swarm as a natural analog of CO two storage and leakage. So this is the question of CO two leakage: how much is actually being dumped out of 
into the oceanic reservoir and atmospheric reservoir as a result of natural processes. And this is not something that's been quantified to any high degree of accuracy yet. But the working assumption for political purposes is, is we can just ignore all that and consider that the only, the, the only variability driving carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere now is human activity. Stop so, earthquakes, fix climate change. Yeah. There you go. That's what we should do. And this is what I have here, one of my favorite Bracking. quotes by H.L. Mencken. <laughs> Well known, but it's certainly true. The whole aim of practical populist politics is to keep the populace alarmed by an endless series of hobgoblins, most of them imaginary. So, uh, I like that quote. Okay, I, I was looking for one more graph here that would really kind of, again, provide perspectives. And... Uh, Oh, I'll, I'll revisit another quote while you're looking. Yeah, for that. yeah, yeah. Great. It is the doom of man that they forget. Oh yeah, that's another one of my favorite quotes. It is the doom of men that they forget. What, what do you think, Mike? About what? Global warming in general, climate well, change. I what? think we could say that. Mike looks at things pretty realistically. I don't think Mike is looking at things through, you know, an ideological lens like I a lot of people. To. No, I, I, I think, you know, the very fact that Mike is here with us and all this shows it. I mean, he's got an active, open mind. That's, and I respect well, him for that. You know, Even if we I, disagree on some things. Um, climate change is, it's one of those things where... I, I confess, I it is way above my pay grade. I try to follow the arguments. I listen to Randall. What Randall says makes a lot of sense. Um, and yet there's so much, as, as Brad puts it, propaganda on either side. Um, contrary. You know, yeah, there's so, such contrary arguments. Um, you know, it, it's... What, what, what bothers me about all of this, though, is you can argue the facts, you know, and you can argue even alternative facts. But when it gets to the point where it's name calling, when people say, oh, if you don't agree with us, you're a climate denier. Yeah. Well, that's what bothers me. You know, we can discuss facts. We can discuss what the facts are, what they mean. But when it gets to the point where, you know, you can't discuss the facts and you shut off argument and to, to, to the, the, as Randall says, oh, the science is settled. Well, I was discussing this with a friend of mine whose wife is a is a scientist. She's not in this field, and she's in, in the health field. And you know, we were discussing this, and she said, "Well, you know, the science is settled." I said, "Well, that's the problem I have. Science is never settled." And she, I said, "You're a scientist. You should know that. You know, we used to think um, germs were not real. You know, it was what I think the human ovum was not discovered until 1827." You know, germs and microbes were not real until, what, late 1800s? Um, they weren't taken seriously. You know, so much of what we know, we think we know, there's a lot we still don't know. Um, and to say the science is settled on the face is, is, a, is a ridiculous statement to make because the science is always changing. Um, and that's the purpose of science. Yeah. Uh, so, the, you know, I, I can listen to this. I can listen to Randall's arguments, and Randall makes very cogent arguments. He has, he has, what I like about Randall is, even though I disagree with him about some things, he, he, he listens to facts. He states facts. He, he trots out charts more than anybody else. So his, ar his arguments, are per, to me, are persuasive. Um, the, I keep going back to, the, to a chart I've seen previously. Uh, he's used in several of his presentations where it's showing the, uh, the, the temperature changes. And it looks to me, you look at this over th tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, it looks like an EKG. It goes up, goes yeah. down on a yeah, regular yeah. basis. Yeah. And you look at where we are, we're at the very tip of the latest change. And if you look at that and you look at the past history, you think, oh my God, we're due for, for a downturn. You know, in spite of what the, the evidence says around us, and, and people, as Brad says, people have a very short memory. We only think back to what we know in the last five years, last 10 years, whatever, or even in our lifetimes, if we're lucky. Um, 
but that's a very limited time scale. So if, if, if you've never seen a drought like the one we've had out west, then yeah. But as, as Randall said earlier, we had a drought in the 1930s that was nearly destroying the economy. The Dust Bowl, people forget about that. Um, so that's what I think. It, it, it's, a conv- it's a complex question. There are no easy answers to it. You know, but when you get political about it, when you start saying, oh, you're wrong, uh, you know, show you me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of temperature records that are still standing from 1936. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother Richard was just uh, uh, over lunch the other day, it's Sunday. We, uh, he was telling about these, these videos from, uh, I don't know whether it was the Rhine or one of the other rivers in Germany that uh, they're discovering that there are markers yeah, that have rocks. been carved in. Yeah, right. Carved in the stone and the rock. It's you know, they're saying they're dating like you know 1500s or 1600s, and yeah, they're like, the, what do they say? Some of them say, if you see me, you know, weep or something yeah, like that. Right. If you see me weep. Yeah. I said, geez. So these are things that we've that human history has experienced, and we forget that. Yes, I have a couple of news stories uh, recently came out that I've saved uh, to report on on our show, and they're basically. Um, freaking out about climate change, but at the same time showing all these archaeological finds that are happening because of the climate change. So the oh, ice yeah. is melting and they're finding villages and the yeah. the yeah. lakes are drying up and they're finding where people lived. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> yeah, the, what's the, the problem with this picture? And, and just saw one recently of a, of a a boulder in the bottom of a lake with a Buddha carved on it. Right. The, yeah. the, 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 what, a thousand years ago. So... Yeah, well, yeah. It, it's like well, they're freaking out that the ice is melting because that's got to be terrible for the planet. But they find, yeah, a where people were living right. that used to be there. Yes, yeah, so you're like, wait a minute. So it's, it's just going it's, back. It's been gone before. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, multiple times, and we're gonna. Yeah, I mean, it, it were the next three or four episodes. We're that's one of the things we're gonna dive into, uh, because there's some really interesting studies out there. The, um, so a couple of years ago, I got a, a, a National Geographic in the mail that had a um, a cover story and a long article about the uh, the Ice Age floods. Well, not the but the the rise of the of oceans during the Ice Age, mm-hmm. and they were dredging in the North Sea, and they were surprised to find human artifacts from the seabed in the North Sea. <laughs> And Doggerland, yeah, Doggerland, I guess. I but, but yeah. It, it, so this this surprised everybody. It's like, why are we finding? Well, because this the seabed was land at one point. You know. Yep. Yeah, and not that long ago. Not that long ago. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. The whole North a... Sea was. Remember the, the 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 British Isles were not islands during the Ice Age. They were connected. Yeah. To the European mainland. Yeah, there was no English Channel. There was no English Channel. Yeah, in fact, uh, James Mitcher, no, not James Mitcher, Edward Rutherford, a guy, an English author that I know and I'm very fond of, he's written some very historical novels that are sort of uh, James Mitcher like, long uh-huh. time scale. He starts one of his novels about, I think it's uh, titled Sarum, um, about ancient England. He's, his novel begins with this character crossing from Europe into what is now England, but as he crosses over, he hears in the distance this huge grinding, crashing sound as the uh, uh, the waters come down and wash away the land behind him. Uh, you know, creating creating England as an island. Oh, so you know, it, the idea has been out there. It's just you know, well, what, like what I, said, was, I guess probably conceived as fiction as, yeah. is real. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, the English channel, the bottom, the floor of the English channel is like severe scab lengths. Also has because, a giant crater in it. Impact yeah. The, that recently discovered one. That one didn't know about the crater. There's an impact crater between there. Yeah. 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 There was one. I, the, no, I would that be the that. one off of Norway or. So, uh, so on the pull- other hand, though, I want I do want to point out that uh, 
Randall, you say this whenever we're uh, usually when we're talking about the climate climate subject that this doesn't mean that we should just do whatever we want, right? You say like we need to be good stewards of the planet, and that in a lot of cases you feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you feel like the whole that that that, that the focus on carbon dioxide is a problem because we have plenty of of pollution things that we could work on to fix or other areas that we could work on, but there's all this huge focus on CO2. Right. That's where all the money's going. That's where all the focus where is all going. The money's, so it's, it's taking money away from other, from other actually good environmental right. practices. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, and that's and, one and of my the, primary criticisms of the whole the, thing. The, the, the environmental laws have done a lot of good. Look at the skies in LA, the, the way they used to be and the way they are now, even, even closer to home, look at Birmingham. I remember when I was a kid in, in high school, we went over to, from Montgomery, went over to Birmingham, uh, when we went over the mountain into Birmingham, Birmingham sits in a valley. And from my understanding, it's one of the few places in the world where all the ingredients to make steel are located. Water, coal, mm -hmm. yeah. iron ore, and limestone, all right. in one place. Um, but you go into Birmingham, and it's in a valley. We went over that hill, the mountain into Birmingham, and my eyes stung because the, 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 the smog was so bad in that valley. Well, it's clean now. Yeah. You know, yes, we shouldn't shit in our own nest. Well, I bet they had beautiful sunsets. <laughs> no, I, I like that. When they Mike, what you just said, that's exactly right. We shouldn't shit in our own nest. We shouldn't. Right. We shouldn't. Um, yes, and and th that you're exactly right, Russ. I mean, you know, there are issues, and and I we should actually devote some time to what I think really are pressing environmental issues that are affecting lots and lots of people around the planet. I don't think carbon dioxide. First of all, there's several things that we need to dive into and look at. You know, carbon dioxide has is, is sort of bimodal in its effect. It has two primary roles in nature. One is is its thermal capture ability. You know, it's it's so called, even though it's not actually a greenhouse effect per se. The idea that that it that it vibrates in that fifteen to seventeen micron wavelength, and because of that, it's it's basically deflecting photons back towards the Earth that are coming into contact with the, the carbon dioxide in these uh, long wavelengths. The carbon dioxide is completely transparent to the short wavelengths coming in from above, but is trans is uh, opaque, opaque to the uh, to the longer the long wave length. So the photons making up those wavelengths are reflected some of them back, obviously not all of them. However, that capture window is almost completely dominated by water vapor. And that's, again, when we discuss in more depth the two functions of carbon dioxide in nature, that's one. The other, of course, is photosynthesis. Um, without carbon dioxide, plants die. And there are plants now that are, have, have become adapted to a low carbon, low carbon dioxide environment. And of course, if we have an increase in carbon dioxide, those plants are probably not going to prosper under a high carbon dioxide because they're adapted to low carbon dioxide. The interesting though, most of the high carbon dioxide plants are the are are food. The low carbon dioxide, if you want to just use a, a you know a vernacular term, we call them weeds. Um, it's an interesting dynamic there that I want to explore. And I get into that in that 90 page essay about yes. primarily photosynthesis. But one of, I'm going to pull up another graph here because I want to, again, to help put some of this in perspective. In very round numbers, over the last century, since the beginning of major carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, we've that we or some combination of fossil fuel consumption, also cement production, will put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because you're basically crushing and processing limestone to produce concrete. And so in the production of concrete, you have the, um, the emission, the release of carbon dioxide that's locked up into those limestone rocks that we were talking about earlier. So that that is actually a fairly significant source of carbon dioxide outgassing is is concrete or cement production right so what about making what about making gravels quarrying limestone does, does oh that, yeah. yeah all of that, all of that has effect okay yeah um so uh 
so anyways, roughly, we're talking about 100 parts per million increase, right? From 300 parts per million to 400 parts per million, right? 300 parts per million early in the industrial rev, they, you know, most of the records, and we're going to look at those records too, because some of the records from ice cores don't match up with other records of carbon dioxide concentration. And that's an important thing to look at as well. Not tonight, we're not going to talk about that. But, but um, when you look at 300 parts per million, which is early in the increase, right, to 400 parts per million, a little bit more than it is now, just in round numbers, we can say 100 parts per million, right? So in other words, 100 uh, molecules of carbon dioxide have increased per every million molecules of air, right? So think about that, what that translates into. 100 parts per million is one part per 10,000. All right, got it? So now what we're going to, just just to help put this in perspective, I created this graph right here. Are we seeing this? 10,000 yeah. to one. So, yeah, so that actually is 10,000 dots. That represents 10,000 molecules of air, right? I laboriously created this, you know, <laughs> methodically create one at a time. No, not really. I did create this, but 10,000 was... mouse clicks. <laughs> yeah, 10,000 mouse clicks later, actually. A <laughs> hundred times what? How many lines? Uh, many it's a hundred times a like hundred. Okay. Yeah, a hundred across and a hundred down. There so, but yeah, I, I it wasn't laboriously one at a time. I was able to create one dot and then multiple copy it across the top a hundred times or ninety nine times. Then I was able to select that hundred and multiple copy down. So it wasn't. Yeah, that's still a huge pain. <laughs> it's a chore. Yeah. Oh, was yeah. I it, have a graphics it, program that I could have just drawn a square for you, and they would have all been in there. But anyway, I'm glad you what? made it. What are you talking about? Yeah. You could have just drawn a square. Well, I mean, hey, it didn't take me but a few minutes okay, to do great. it. Okay, it's great. 10,000 okay. dots. Yeah. And so then that's 10,000 10, molecules of air, right? Well, as far as that goes now, here next to it, right down here, there's your one molecule there's, of carbon dioxide. That's how much it's increased? Yes. Group. Since the Industrial Revolution. That is that that little guy right there is what's supposedly going to cause global catastrophe that's driving us into the climate crisis. We need to change society because of that, Randall. Yeah, we yeah. Well, we need to st shut down Western civilization because of that little guy right there. Electric cars is the way. Coal powered cars. <laughs> so that yeah, just puts it in nuts. that's that's what. A hundred yeah. parts per million looks like, comparatively speaking. Well, and just to reiterate where, where Russ was going, I mean, in no way are we saying or Randall saying that, you know, we can trash the environment and it's okay to just create the mess that we're doing. You know, we got to be stewards of this planet and we got to be better with what we're doing with, with 8 billion people. Um, but, but there are bigger concerns and there are some exaggerations on the facts that supposed facts that we're getting from the, again, supposed authorities. Well said. And, and yeah, and I definitely want to dive into some of the, those things that um, I think really are deserving of more attention. And uh, so, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we go through, I mean, you know, there's a lot of claims being made and most of it is just, you know, people are being spoon fed this, pre-digested propaganda and you know we've been instilled or inculcated into this kind of authoritarian mindset that oh the experts have it all explained that's kind of the impression that 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 they want to create oh there's experts the experts have said i mean how many times i pick up an article i'm reading it and it says well the experts have said blah 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 and then it never names the experts it just says oh the experts never. what experts you know it's kind of like it reminds me of the 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 end of the the Indiana Jones and the um the first one, the best one, the the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that one? Temple of Doom? Is it no? No, that was the second one. That was the second one. Uh 
Raiders of the Lost Raiders Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, Raiders yeah, of the it. Lost Ark. You remember right yeah. at the end, these 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 government bureaucrats are basically they've they've taken the ark away from him, and he's and, and you know now, Indiana Jones is obviously he's the top guy in the world when it comes to understanding that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> and 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 the government agent says. You know, I don't remember the exact words, but the idea was, you know, Indiana Jones challenges and says, you know, we, we're going to put our people on it. Um, and then Indiana Jones goes, well, you know, he knows already that, you know, there's nobody who has knowledge that qualifies them to, to make sense out of this. And he says something like, he says, well, we're going to put our top men on it. And then Indiana Jones says, well, who, what top men? And he, he goes, our top men. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, and it's kind of like that to me. I, I think of that quite frequently. It's kind of like the government comes out and says, our top men are on this. You know, we know there's a scientific consensus. The science is settled. Our top men are working on it. The experts have concluded. And then how they get away with it is nobody does the deep dive like we're trying to do right here. Although there are there are more, you know, um, obviously there are more uh, people out there. And, 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 and the, the tactic. The tactic is always the same. Like, for example, one of the most, one of the best websites devoted to looking at the whole issue of the the the, the politicization of climate change and all that is what's up with that. Anthony Watts established this site decades ago, maybe. Um, and you go to Wikipedia, and the first thing it says, and I've been reading regularly that website and others from all perspectives for for twenty years, based since since I've been on the internet. Uh, you know, um, and then you go to Wikipedia and it says uh, that what's up with that is a climate denying website. Yet in 20 years, I have never seen a single thing where they're denying climate change. Not one. So clearly this is this is how they they treat. Well, just like I showed you, I pulled up that one slide, you know, well, you know, some say that scientists are in disagreement. Right. Well, they're still putting out the climate denier. They're still using that label that anybody who questions, all you have to do is ask questions about the narrative. And that makes you a climate change denier. But here's the thing. If you want to know, you know, the opposition perspective and how and really what your opponent, how qualified they are to actually get in the ring. Well, as soon as they say and call somebody and use the term climate change denier, that tells you right there. Tells you right there. You don't have an argument. You don't have facts. All you're doing is you have a name that you can call. And you think that if enough people call that name over and over again and say the same stuff over and over again, the authorities, the experts, then it's the end of the matter. And you can go back to your job or whatever you're doing in order to make sure that you can pay your taxes so that we can then redistribute that that money to elsewhere uh, to buy the uh, preferred outcomes, and that's exactly what they're doing. There, there, there are factions, political factions, that are buying outcomes. And like you said earlier, I think Russ, you said that, you know, or Brad said that, um, you know, I mean, they're buying off scientists. Yeah. It's it's they are buying off scientists, and the the money is just too much there. And and we could look at things. I don't know how much time we got left, but you know, going into the things that um, I'm reaching for the hat, reaching for the hat. Okay, well, I won't I won't divide into anything new. We've got a lot more to explore yeah, got, in this area. We got plenty of shows coming up. Oh Those yeah, great material. stuff. Yes, great material. Before we go, I'm, I gotta I I'm gotta just, just let you guys know real quick that I was talking about Silver Pit Crater, and it's it's in the southern oh, yeah. southern North Sea. Yeah, yeah. So make that correction. I've I've heard of Southern that. Southern North Sea. Okay. And I'll also I'm say, you know, wondering if. Oh, if, go ahead, uh, Brad. Go no, ahead. it's going to be a bad joke. So go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with bad jokes. Uh, it's it's past. Oh, it's it's okay. It's time has passed. Yep. Sorry, Brad. There's, you know, we've we've mentioned this before, but um, when we're talking about, uh, you know, cleaning up the planet and everything, like, for example, we went to Egypt and you can understand yeah. Yeah. how uh, necessary it is to have large systems in place to keep things clean. Like Mike was talking about, like environmental 
uh, you know, agencies that or whatever systems, mm-hmm. institutions mm-hmm. that will clean things up, that will, you know, get groups of people together to go out and pick up trash, whatever it is, you know, mm-hmm. campaigns to get people to stop littering, all that kind of things. Because, you know, when you're, when we were in Egypt, it's like you, you want to start one of those organizations when you're looking mm-hmm. around, yeah. you see just, it's just, you know, there's trash everywhere and it, it's, stacked. it's appalling. Yeah. It yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, in they have canals but, and you can see how the canal system is supposed to feed their, their yep. agriculture, but it's just completely, completely filled, yeah. choked with trash. Yeah. And they come and dredge it out every once in a while. And then all that trash ends up on the sides of the canals and all, I mean, it's just, it's awful. It's, it is. You know, I know. So you, My, you understand the nece- the necessity for continuous An organized effort up. to, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And also how, lucky we are to be in a place that has those systems in place. I mean, it's like, mm-hmm. we, yeah. it's amazing here. When you come back here from being there for so long, you're just like, wow. Yeah. Everything's is, yeah. so clean. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing. And so it just, it just kind of, yeah. It makes you realize like how lucky we are to have the, to be able to, at least to have it at the level that we have, you know, the, the cleanliness and the stewardship. Mm-hmm. And it's sure. interesting because that opens up a whole nother, you know, level of discussion about, you know, environmental impact and how, you know, it almost takes social evolution to get to a point where we have what we have here. Yes. Yeah. yeah so I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying that like our, for our, from our perspective, we've been to Egypt, so we saw it there. I'm not trying yeah. to trash Egypt, but I, it, it no, makes you wonder not. too if there's if there's something about a wealthy civilization that is much more able to clean up after itself. Yes, you know, I think that's almost a foregone conclusion when you look at so many third world countries yeah. that are almost mirror images of of uh, Egypt. Yes, right. I've talked to people to say it's the same thing with India. You know, like, but the but mm-hmm. the 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 more wealthy an area gets, it cleans up after itself. And so you, yes. you know, the idea is, is that is, is the civilization we've built that's based in a lot of ways off of the use of fossil fuel as an energy, you know, that generates yeah. wealth and, and mobility and enterprise yes. and all this stuff, then they end up being able to clean up after themselves. So it, it's like stopping that system seems to me like it's go, it's going to go back to everything being trashed. I would have to agree. But then, you know, what will ultimately happen, though, is then we will see depopulation. Okay. Yeah. That's we'll right. see depopulation. And, you know, if to, there are some people out there that think, oh, to save the planet, we have to have depopulation. You're right, because because we couldn't we couldn't maintain the, the farming system and the transportation system without all. Yeah, you're right. So it, you, but, people but would end up I think that's I think that's totally wrong. I think this planet can easily support 10 billion people. And I don't think, I think what we're seeing now is a inverse exponential curve of population growth. And in the next 50 to hundred years, it's almost certain from what, if present trends continue, that population is going to pretty much stabilize. It's, ta- it's tapering off. Yeah. It, it is definitely tapering off. All right. And um, so, yeah, a lot of interesting questions. And, and the thing that I've been hammering on lately is the attempts to suppress asking legitimate questions. And uh, so I would like to say before we go, I'd like to thank the patrons who have hung in there with us, uh, in spite of the fact that we've been a bit irregular, uh, you know, in our um, in our presentations. That's because and to a large extent, we're out there either teaching or traveling and doing research to try to bring more information to this uh, to this podcast. So give us a little slack there. So I want to say. Thanks to all the patrons that have that have hung in there with us. I also want to mention that we now have, uh, I think it's available now. If not, it it will be in the very new future, like within the next few days, the um, the recording of the introductory sacred geometry workshop. Um, and it's like eleven hours of instruction, and it's going to serve as sort of the basic introduction to the hands-on course that we're we're developing right now that will come out this fall. So there's that. And then also we've yeah, got that's, uh, that's ready to go. The, the $72 purchase of the video on demand of the live stream in Nashville. Yeah, that is, that is ready to go. So to, it's definitely there by the time this will come out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. It, I got to there, there yeah. the next day, actually they, they, okay. they fast tracked it. All right. And then there's also 
a few more seats available for the Scablands tour. That's right. And this is Sign a chance up. if if you haven't experienced these in, these incredible landscapes firsthand, you're in for a mind blowing experience. And you know, I think everybody here agrees that it's really important that more and more people become aware of this planet's catastrophic history. The final thing I'm going to say is I just want to remind everybody that uh, I am not affiliated with Sacred Geometry International. The uh, the guy running it continues to sell my work, use my name, my face, and but anything you buy from that website does not go to me. It goes to who knows what, but it's a total scam. Just I want people to know that. So don't patronize that site. And if you're looking for anything sacred geometry related, particularly the course, he's been selling uh, without permission a course that's unfinished. It's a beta version from 10 years ago. So don't spend your money on it because what's coming down the pipeline is 10 times more awesome. Yeah. RandallCarlson.com. RandallCarlson.com. Right. That was the only source that's for right. real stuff. And and this team of guys right here, I just want to say, I want to say this publicly, how much I really appreciate you guys and how much I've enjoyed working with you guys. Likewise, Brad, for absolutely. 25 years, you Serpent Brothers for, what, three years now? Yep, God darn, half, we've yeah. had some 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 great times we've together, had, and great memories. To yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we really uh, straddled a hump there when these guys showed up and uh, new new trends of travel and fun mm -hmm. and uh, increasing the community and the the family. You know, it's, it's really been amazing. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. That is a, a point of major shift right there. Yeah. yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, guys. we're honored to be a part of it. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Check out Cosmic Tusk, but it's, I'm sure that um, George is going to be posting all the information on there coming up after it's all worked out. Are, coming, we, get, coming are, soon. We, are we getting him to the Scablands? I need to call this guy. You know, he, yeah, he, he needs George. to get promising, there. He keeps promising to show up, and I don't, I'm going to call him and be like, dude, you need to be there. He has a uh, high school age son, and that has been conflictatory. But yeah, eventually we will yeah, Bring your high school age and son. get him out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I'll send him some dirty I want to say thank you to a beautiful couple that was in uh, the Nashville Sacred Geometry course. Oh, uh, yeah. From Toronto that, that gave me this hat. Very generous and kind. And they thought I should have that and or have this. And uh, of course, Toronto is the home of uh, my favorite band, Rush. So that uh, got on the inside too. And uh, I'm, it was Basco, Fosco, uh, and I believe Christine, and I'm sorry if I got that wrong, but beautiful young couple. And uh, they, they love the class of sacred geometry there with Randall. And, and thank you for the hat. There we go. Great show, guys. See you All next right, time. Yes. Inside you, there is one wolf, Brad. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.